Right. Now we're joined by Courtney Gregoire, who's running for Port Commission Position 2. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Great. Um, I am here today to seek your support again for re-election to the Port of Seattle Commission. If you may recall, I was uh, appointed two years ago and ran for the two-year unexpired term. Um, I am proud of, of what I've been able to help accomplish in the last two years, but I'm really running because there's a lot more work to be done. Um, uh, so let me start with some of the things I'm most proud of. Uh, the first and foremost is after years of race to the bottom uh, competition between the ports of Seattle and the ports of Tacoma, I I'm really proud that we've been able to forge a new seaport alliance that I think is a good form of collaborative governance and is intended to grow and I need to emphasize grow our maritime manufacturing and trade footprint for good middle class jobs throughout our region. Uh, I, I'm very proud of both how we approach that process, happy to talk more about that at any time, and to me what it will mean for our economy. Uh, but we need to continue to negotiate in good faith and get that across the finish line. Second, um, I uh, took a really hard look at uh, SeaTac Airport. Uh, and we've got tremendous growth and opportunities there, but there are a lot of challenges. So one of the first steps I took was a nine-month process to make sure we were addressing contractor wages and benefits. We set a policy that ensured that January of this year, uh, all, all contractors should make 1150 and should have access to benefits as well as paid sick leave. Now, being sued by the Airport Trade, Trade Association, but I'm optimistic, and courts have already said they do believe we have the authority to take this type of action. So we got some challenges ahead of us, uh, and not the least of which is one of my disappointments. And that is, we want to be an environmentally sustainable port. That means we have to walk the walk and talk the talk. And in my eyes, uh, a temporary lease, even if it's temporary, with Foss Maritime and Shell Oil at Terminal 5 does not do that. And that's why I opposed it and want to make sure that we actually live up to our environmental commitments. Thank you. Great. So now we have four prepared questions. We're asking everybody for port, and it's in front of you if you want to turn it over. But please leave it when you leave. I think we left off. Um, Liz, will you read question number one for the Port Commission? Courtney, what is your plan to keep the Port of Seattle competitive when other ports offer similar services at lower cost? Great question. Um, I think the steps we took with the Seaport Alliance were the first because we want to really position ourselves as a regional gateway um, that's flexible. Um, uh, I, I don't need to start with the premise, why do we even want to attract this business? And here in this region, why we want to attract this business is because uh, it's not just the imports that support jobs, it's the exports. Um, it's really the 70% uh, uh, of our, our exports that can get around the globe because of this footprint. And so attracting that cargo is critical to our entire state's economy. So how do we do it competitively? We've got to keep our eyes on the ball, the real competition, on the West Coast. That's LA, Long Beach, and that's Vancouver and Prince Rupert. And so the Seaport Alliance offers a good start, but we've got to be investing in transportation infrastructure. And I think, uh, first and foremost, uh, the Alliance actually enables us to have a smarter conversation with that, about that with our state legislature uh, and uh, needs to continue in our region in other ways. Finishing 167 and 509, for example, is critical to that. Um, lastly, uh, I would uh, continue to say that our environmental investments are a business advantage. I, I'm hoping that the trend continues where multinational corporations, driven by consumers, Think about their supply chain. Think about the labor implications of where they're sourcing their labor from. Think about their environmental footprint. If we continue to position ourselves as the Green Gateway, the lowest cost footprint from Asia to Chicago, we can really have a business advantage. Great. Mary, number two. You've already indicated this, but what is your position on the lease to Shell Oil, including both the substance of the deal and the process the Port Commission used to reach it? It's a great question. Um, because uh, the short-term uh, lease at Foss Maritime was under five years uh, uh, and under a certain dollar threshold, in theory under um, the Port of Seattle operations, that discretion was left to the CEO and did not need to be brought to the Commission. Uh, I was fundamentally not okay with that. Um, but it took kicking and screaming to ensure that we had a public discussion about this on January 13th, at which time I opposed uh, the deal. And I, and I need to express something, which is, to those who say the role of the port is purely to drive business, to drive revenue, and to ensure maritime jobs, I actually believe our job is to represent our community. Uh, and that is why we have publicly elected 
court commissioners. And so it is okay to have an opinion that may differ sometimes from the concept of driving revenue forced revenue jobs, and that opinion needs to be voiced. Uh, I, I, I stated my opposition because of the impacts on climate change. I stated my opposition because of the horrendous, devastating effects that an oil spill would have up there with limited capability of the Coast Guard or anyone to respond. Uh, but then I stated my opposition because I don't think the public had enough time to weigh in. Um, and I asked uh, for additional time for public comment and public hearing. Uh, and, and it was, was very saddened that we left this to the discretion of our CEO. Today, I think uh, we've heard for months now, you didn't have enough public comment, but we also expect decisions of this significance to the community to be commission decisions, mm -hmm. not CEO decisions. Okay, sure, the dollar threshold wasn't reached. Okay, sure, the least... I'm not changing any of that. There is a community value in making sure you can hold the politically accountable people politically accountable. Um, so unfortunately, both parts of your question I'm not happy with. <laughs> Outcome or process. Uh, Clayton, number three. What changes or reforms do you support for the Port Commission itself? Um, let me start with a couple small ones and then talk about some broad. Um, uh, first, uh, I have to admit, maybe it's because of um, expecting a, a second daughter in June, I was shocked and appalled to learn that the Port of Seattle does not have paid family leave. Uh, we are one of the most robust, we are the most robust benefits package of any public agency. Um, and to not have fa paid family leave, um, I think everyone in this room can understand, is, is not just about maternal health and newborn health, it's about family bonding, bonding, and to be perfectly frank, it's about addressing gender inequality in the workforce. And so uh, we'll be taking up our salary and benefits resolution as we do every year this fall, and I've already made clear that there better be a recommendation in there to start paid family leave. Um, we also need some changes and reforms reference to the, the previous question, um, which is we need a commission to recognize when there are issues of public significance, they deserve to be aired. That's a hard thing to define, and I, I don't have an answer for you yet what it's defined, but I've made pretty crystal clear that running a business does mean you leave certain business level decisions to a CEO. A dollar threshold, uh, uh, a time limit, that's okay. But there are other times to bubble up. And I think, um, in fact, in frank conversations with our CEO since then, he recognizes that as well. Uh, lastly, I'm very proud that we are going to have some organizational changes. We used to have a seaport, an airport, and a real estate division. We're an economic development agency. We should be driving economic development from job creation and broader impact. And when you thought about things that siloed, uh, I'm, we didn't think we were doing it right. So we brought in a new CEO. He's creating an economic division, development division that real estate will report to, but has a mandate that's much broader. Partner to drive true economic development. Middle class job growth, workforce tra training where appropriate to support maritime and aviation. And think about real estate as a tool, not the be all and end all. Evan, number four. Do you believe we have achieved full transparency in the port's contracting and compensation practices? And where do you see possibilities for further improvement? I really have not read question four before I was answering question three, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, taking them as they come. Um, I, 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 no, I, I don't think we have. Um, uh, first and foremost, I saw a couple eyes raised when I told you we didn't have paid family leave at the Port of Seattle. Um, so uh, that's clear that we don't from a compensation perspective. I also recognize every time I've talked to, to an individual or to a group about um, the, the limited uh, uh, authority of a special purpose district like the port. We have Port of Seattle direct employees. We then have 17 bargaining unit, units that are Port of Seattle direct employees. But we then lease property uh, to private sector who have their employees or use contractors. Uh, and we have to approach all of those things differently. And it's often hard to explain why you have a different standard for airline contractors than you do for Port of Seattle employees. Uh, and we, we, we need to explain that, be transparent about it. Okay. And so when I started addressing this issue at SeaTac Airport, the first thing I said is, why can't I understand the wage and benefit structure of the people who are operating Anthony's and the people who are running security on our tarmac? They are doing business on public property. They can report that to us. And that's the only way we can actually understand where we need to make some policy changes. 
And so we have asked uh, for that in future contracts, that we actually understand the wages and benefits of the employees of those who are leasing property. Um, but the other com component here, um, I think, is that the line I told you on Terminal 5 is a line that the public doesn't know or understand. And so when we just passed a new delegation of authority, which is uh, how we tell our CEO, what's your authority and what do we reserve to the commission, we have said we're going to take on some policy working groups, and one of those specifically is procurement and contracting. I'm concerned about it from a perspective of the public doesn't know when and where they can weigh in. Shoshul Marina bathrooms is a perfect example as we were upgrading that facility. Um, but secondly, um, I also think we hear from the business community who says, I don't understand the rules of the game, and so I don't know the best way to do business with you. And so we need to be taking on both those issues. So now we'll open up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. Uh, Sarah. So I appreciate your commitment to the environment, and I know you ran as an environmental candidate, and I understand the scale consequences of you know, drilling in the Arctic, et cetera. So I'm just curious as to why you didn't kind of force a more public process, or at least more public input. And in retrospect, would you have done something different, maybe a public vote um, of the port commissioners, or some type of more robust public involvement process? A, a, a very, very good question. Um, so I talk about that committee meeting on January, commission meeting on January 13th that I was chairing, and I think about it all of the time um, because I walked in with a very firm understanding that I was going to express my opposition, that I may not have a majority to express the opposition, but I really thought we would have a majority to say, today is not the day to make this decision. We need some more time to have some right. more input. And as the commission proceeded, the meeting proceeded, and that was not the case. I did not have a majority to even delay granting the authority to the, to the CEO. It, it was a very difficult place for me to be um, uh, and, and chairing. In, in retrospect, there is one thing I would have fundamentally said. Uh, port staff, uh, when they first briefed, briefed us on the subject, had a non-disclosure agreement with the business that they were negotiating with. Um, I have made crystal clear, we can't have that because we're a public agency. So you can't make a commitment to a private sector that this is not going to be aired in public ever. That can't be part of the negotiation. The terms of the deal when you're negotiating, we all understand how business works. That's okay. But there is going to be a time that this gets, and that could have been sped up. Um, and for that, I, I absolutely admit I would have done that differently and said it's time to open it up. Thanks. All right. I have a question then, Evan. Um, so, again, back to Shell. So, um, <laughs> look, so looking forward, I'm, or right, right now forward, what, I'm wondering what the options are to sort of limit this. I understand like when a, a new lease comes up, you know, the process could be different, but this monstrosity is floating its way right now. I saw the pictures, it's huge. Everyone's gonna see it, everyone's gonna freak out. It's, you know, so what can we do now to um, sort of limit the effects of this and end it as fast as possible? So, um, it's been a lot of time. I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer by trade. I have read that lease backwards and forwards. Um, the first thing that we could, that we did, I should say, um, is uh, the lease was executed on February 9th by our CEO. The lease was for a two-year term with a two-year option. The way the option could be exercised is simply, uh, FOSS can say, I want to exercise the option, and then, as I just explained to you, of course, the CEO could then just say, yeah, go ahead. So. We, 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 once a lease is signed, I think we, we all recognize that breaching that contract puts us on the hook for all types of, types of liability, and in this case, it could be lost profits from Shell. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the dollar amount could ratchet up beyond. So without breaking the lease, we made very clear that two-year option requires commission input. You're not doing this, CEO, you're coming back to us. Um, secondly, I'm gonna say this, which is, so we may have addressed this one piece, but there was a much broader conversation that we need to have about what is it our, our region believes is true economic development. And as we go into the Seaport Alliance, the principle I just articulated to you that Arctic drilling does not make sense and is not part of our maritime business will be the same principle I take to the Seaport Alliance when these decisions are made in a regional level. Um, but we need to, as a community, recognize that we're going to have to talk to a broader region about that. Okay. Uh, I really want to ask you about Shell, but I it's have okay. something else to ask you entirely. <laughs> oh. uh, the, I am I'm sure you're aware that the port is currently working with the city of Seattle uh, regarding the possibility of a heavy wall network. 
down in the Duwamish manufacturing industrial area. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uncertainty that we're feeling at the moment with respect to how much this might cost the city, even 5, 10, 20 years down the road in terms of major maintenance on our roads, and talk about the port's potential contribution. Sure. And what, what you're, even if it's just philosophically, sort of what your thoughts are on that. Yes, can I, can I give you, can I, I don't mean to directly tie it back to Shell, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> we spent years <laughs> negotiating that heavy haul corridor. That is critical to the question you asked, which is how do we actually address uh, being competitive and cost competitive. Years negotiating. We worked with the mayor's office when they came in new. We were so happy that this legislation was going to be moving to the city council. Guess what? Guess the reason it was pulled off the agenda two weeks ago. And this is exactly what I shared with my colleagues, which is why do we think about what the broader public thinks about? Because we've got to be a partner with our city and a partner with our region if we're going to be competitive. So, Shell's what pulled it off the agenda. Okay. So how do we get back on the agenda? We do need to be a partner as we think about that heavy haul corridor. And so we talk about the initial investment. We talk about making sure that um, uh, I think the smart thing, it will reduce the cost on the truck drivers right now who have an uncertainty on when they walk, when they get to that terminal and are sometimes assessed a special fee because they're going to have a, a heavier haul. We will address that issue. But the cost savings that we work with those folks, we need to be reinvesting in the network. Um, uh, and so you've got a partner that partnered uh, to address the viaduct, you've got a partner that will partner to address Lander Street overpass and grade separation. Uh, you've got a full partner in terms of, uh, of that going forward. Uh, Clayton? Um, <clears throat> uh, oil trains cross a bridge that's a few hundred yards that way. If one of them explodes, all of us will be dead. All of us understand yeah. the, the <laughs> legal structure of the better state of the at least in crude terms. We know that it's a Victorian that they came out of the railroads. We know we know the giveaways that that uh, that they got. We we understand we understand the, the interstate uh, uh, nature of commerce and that goods must travel freely. There must be freedom for commerce to move. And yet, so, so does all that mean that we're purely and simply at the mercy of, of law and that, and that our, our, uh, uh, our legal structure, our, our, uh, our political structure, in effect, is, is um, so much therapy for the public on the way to an occasional disaster. I mean, how do we think, how do we think creatively and in a tough way about addressing... Time's up. So I feel like I've had two years to think about this issue a little bit, if that makes sense. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting that... Uh, uh, I have thought very creatively about solutions. I think, um, here, here's the challenge right now with oil trains. They are congesting our railway. They're taking up needed infrastructure for us to move containers. They're taking up uh, our infrastructure to move Washington State exports around the globe. They are a major safety issue. And they're not effectively regulated yet at the federal, state, or local level. And so to your point, where's the government play a role? First and foremost, by stepping in and ensuring that uh, we actually impose the appropriate costs from a safety and a security measure uh, that make it such that the private industry engaged in that activity, whatever that activity is, has to incur the whole costs. And to your point, it is meaning also risks that could occur. So uh, I don't think we have that, we don't have that regulatory structure in place right now, and I would absolutely support that. Whether that means they're paying for derailment, economic harm that causes from derailment, the grave consequences you address, which is exactly right, what would happen in an explosion, once we actually build those costs into what it takes to do business, then we can have a meaningful way to measure what's the best use of that infrastructure. I'm put it back. The private sector can have a meaningful way to say, how should I be using that in infrastructure? And, and we don't have that regulatory regime in place right now. Uh, and so I would absolutely support 
uh, strengthening all of those measures. Oh, I might have actually. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> so, 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 so that was a great answer to his 12 questions. Thank you. Um, so we're out of time completely. So if you take 30 seconds to uh, give a closing statement. Um, uh, thank you. Um, thank you sincerely for running a, a, a thoughtful and robust process. I really I mean, appreciate this conversation. It's the first conversation I've had with an LD for this campaign cycle. Um, uh, what I've noticed about this campaign cycle is that the community is asking more direct questions about the Port of Seattle, and therefore I feel like I've accomplished something in two years. Uh, uh, in, in some ways, uh, we have elevated the stature of the Port of Seattle. The Seaport Alliance is a perfect example of that, uh, what we have done to preserve manufacturing and industrial jobs. Um, when we make bad decisions, the community also looks, looks at us and says, I gotta hold these people accountable, and for that I'm thankful. If we continue to do this, if you continue to invest in me and the Port of Seattle, we can be that economic partner that can really drive broader economic growth for our middle class in our region. And that's my commitment to you. Great. Thank you. Yeah.